Good evening. The table is spread and welcome to a special edition of our God Talk Conversation, an intergenerational dinner amongst friends. Tonight we have some amazing people around the table and I wanna jump in and introduce them for this evening. To, starting from my left, Reverend Dr. Michael Waters is an activist, author, teacher, and pastor. He currently serves as the founding pastor of Abundant Life AME Church in Dallas, Texas. Glad to be here and I'm Christian. Ms. Khadija Thomas is an early childhood intervention specialist. She is a graduate of Howard University with a master's of speech language pathology. And I'm a Muslim. Reverend Dr. Brad Braxton is a preacher, scholar, and author. He is the Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Church School Initiatives at the St. Luke School in Manhattan, New York. He also serves as the founder and pastor of the Open Church of Maryland. My tradition is Christianity. Bishop Mio K. Kane Barrett is the Bishop of the Nitran Shoe Order of North America and resident priest of the Mio Kane G Temple in Houston, Texas. Bishop Kane Barrett is the first woman of African Japanese descent and the only Western woman to be ordained as a priest in the Nitran order. Thank you. I am a Nitran shoe Buddhist. Ms. Shaniqua Deason is a mother, social media influencer, and womanist. She's the founder of Diasporian United. I am agnostic. Anna Kabir is a Nigerian American peace officer and bodybuilder. She earned a BA in English from Prairie View A&M University and an MS in criminal justice and criminology from Texas Christian University. I am a member of the Baha'i faith. Dr. Anthony Penn is an author, religion scholar, and commentator. He currently serves as the Agnes Cullen Arnold Professor of Humanities at Rice University. Delighted to be here. I'm a secular humanist. Dr. Bashir Muhammad is a senior researcher at the Pew Research Center. He specializes in studying religious minorities in the U.S. with a specific focus on Muslim Americans. It's a pleasure to be here for another edition of God Talk. Father Daniel Green is a priest in the Archdiocese of New Orleans. He currently serves as the pastor of the Blessed Trinity Catholic Church in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm glad to be here. I am a Christian. Dr. Diana Burnett is a postdoctoral fellow in Black Religion in the Center for the Study of African American Religious Life at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture and Howard University Divinity School. Thank you for having me. I practice Lukumi. Reverend Dr. Brianna Parker is the curator and founder of the Black Millennial Cafe, a consulting practice and data resource center for persons seeking healthy engagement with black millennials of faith. Thank you for having me, I'm Christian. Mr. Rashid Hughes is the restorative justice specialist at School Talk DC and the co-founder and managing director of the Heart Refuge Mindfulness Community, a community-based organization dedicated to providing mindfulness and other healing practices to the African-American community and other communities of color. I'm a mindfulness, yoga, and Buddhist practitioner. Reverend Dr. Yolanda Pierce is a womanist theologian, media commentator, and activist. She currently serves as the Dean and Professor of African American Religion and Literature at Howard University Divinity School. It's an honor to be here. I'm a Christian. Ms. Diamond Styles is a Black trans millennial activist. She is the Executive Director of Black Trans Women, Inc., a national nonprofit focused on social advocacy, positive visibility, and building strong leadership among Black trans advocates, activists, and allies. Mr. Amir McKean is an author and founder of AIC Publications, a publishing company that distributes paperback and digital books focused on the unique experiences of Blacks in America. Thank you, I'm a Muslim. Again, thank you all for joining us for this intimate conversation over dinner. Let's jump right into it. What is, and I'm gonna pose this first question to uh, Bashir, what is the current state of millennial participation in organized faith traditions and what does it mean? Well, what we see is that black millennials are at an interesting intersection of two different patterns in American religious life. On the one hand, we see young people tend to be less religious than older adults. On the other hand, we see black Americans tend to be more religious than non-blacks. And so black millennials 
are both more religious than their non-black peers and less religious than their elders. For me, um, it appears that um, millennials in particular are less concerned about specific religious tradition or becoming a part of, of a particular um, religious community, yet they're focused more on um, having their spiritual needs met. And they're looking for various practices that can support their ability to be well in the present moment. Um, not just concerned about um, things like salvation or, or heaven, or e even if there is a heaven or hell, but more so, how can I live a full, authentic life um, now? And I think that um, for millennials, speaking for myself and people who I, um, who I speak with, I think that we're going through a bit of a burnout. So I think that from our parents' time period, like it was like heavy, heavy, heavy religion, like structured religion. So I think some people just need to breathe right now mm -hmm. and just kind of refocus. So even for myself, like, you know, I'm getting close to 40 in about five years and I could feel myself starting to readjust in my thoughts and my feelings and the way that I view my faith and my belief. Whereas when I was 28, 29, I felt myself kind of pulling away from some of that structure because I needed to. So I think that some of us are experiencing burnout and we just need to push back and breathe. I also find that for a lot of millennials, there's a, a desire to belong. Uh, and so they're looking for that place of belonging and the church isn't always mm -hmm. that place where they can find that belonging, whether it be because they feel judged by older generations hmm. or they don't, they've gone away to college <coughs> and come back and don't know how to reconnect uh, with the community and what is my space. And they're asking questions that the church isn't really uh, engaging with uh, at that level. And so they go and find the place where they belong. Absolutely. And they'll come in and out as they, they feel the need, but uh, they go to the, the space of belonging first. Yeah. I agree with that. When I graduated, I went through that. Um, like I used to, before I moved to the East Coast and went to Howard, um, <coughs> I was I would go to the mosque. Like it was just like a routine. It's something I love to do. So I went to DC. I had this like, this amazing experience. And then I came out of it and here I'm in California. And then I came back to Texas and I felt like a fish out of water. Because culturally, like the way people saw um, life from a religious perspective was so different. Mm -hmm. So for me in the past three years, I have been disengaged mm -hmm. from the message that's near me because of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I church? think we can also look at parenting. Mm -hmm. um, the millennial generation, the black millennial generation would have been the first generation uh, with lower numbers of, of persons who weren't raised in the church. And so there are good part of the demographic who were able to like figure it out and decide if they were going to um, participate in it. There was no real expectation that they were going to be in church every Sunday because they simply did grow up that way. And so we get to see um, now much more diversity as far as spirituality. And as much as parents complain about it, because I think they actually want to treat us like grandparents did like don't keep coming in and out of my house you know like you know either stay in or go out and play you know and i think they kind of feel like that about church but don't keep coming in and out and trying to you know they may not love it but you know if you don't like frankenstein you have to ask who created yeah. frankenstein and some of this is about parenting and so we had options we had choices in ways other people had not and they may not love our choices now but this definitely can be, you know, not everything, but we can definitely take a look at the choices we were given and the fact that this generation wasn't deeply raised in church. I Don't think, you think sorry. also that the quest to find out who they are mm -hmm. yeah. and mm -hmm. to Identity. find the true self mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and doesn't have to be centered on religion. I find that uh, a lot of young people are looking to find yeah. who am I? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. doesn't necessarily have to be defined by faith. Right as much as uh, an, an exploration mm -hmm. to find out those things that can help you reveal that to yourself. Yeah. And I, and I agree with that. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to be that 
you know, the generation before me and my parents' generation where the it was it was common knowledge that at some point you would begin to explore like who who is your God, what is your faith? And it seems to be now that millennials are more so concerned with who am I and and how do I fit into the world? And I need practices to help me to have more self-realization. Mm -hmm. and, and and what I and what I'm kind of challenging people is to explore, does the question, who am I, have to be separate from who is my higher power? Can, can, they, be, can they be one and the same? Do they right. have to be separate? Do, and, or do I have to actually fit into a tradition in, in order to explore who is my God or my higher power? So, One of the joys of being at this table is that there's so many around this table who have taught me even from afar. I can think about uh, Dr. Penn's work in the black church in the post-civil rights era and the decline of the black church following the death of Dr. King, uh, Dr. Parker's work in millennial faith and the fugitives that are present and how the church failed to authentically engage uh, black young people while they were there. And so black millennials have come of age where family institutions have failed them, educational institutions, the church. And because of that uh, experience, I think have a very healthy skepticism of, of these institutions and aren't willing to fully invest their person or their work within these institutions uh, without recognition, one, that it's safe to be present here. Mm -hmm. And then two, uh, that my gifts are valued, mm -hmm. that I'm not put on the back burner, right. that there's something that I have to contribute today mm -hmm. that is essential and necessary uh, for the effectiveness of, of the church. And so um, I, I think in part, that's part of the experience. Uh, these failing institutions, um, often hypocritical uh, mm -hmm. in nature, that have uh, shunned black millennials. And black millennials aren't willing to rush into these spaces mm -hmm. until there's a justification for their presence in those places. I come to this question through the lens of the university classroom and think about the way in which so many of my students who have been millennials actually associate inherently religion with negativity and exclusion, mm -hmm. yeah. and for good reason. <laughs> Quite often, religious traditions have actually been bad representatives of the most noble impulses of these traditions. Mm -hmm. Yet what I find is, as they listen to our classroom conversations, they begin to tease out of me my own religious convictions, mm -hmm. and they begin to realize that religion does not inherently have to equal exclusion, but can be a powerful force for inclusion and justice. Once that happens, what I begin to find out is they start seeking me out in office hours, presenting with issues on the syllabus academic, but actually what they are questing for is that deeper existential soul commitment. Once they hear the sound of the genuine, as Howard Thurman might call it, that sense that religion is not inherently a divisive force, but can be positive, mm -hmm. it taps something very deep in the core of their being. I think we, another thing you have to understand in the context of the past, the church was a place where you were trained to be respectable yeah, so the white on. people won't kill you. Yeah. The church was a place where you go and you found help. You, they taught you how to read there. In the context of the past, they were such an integral part of, you know, how you got to the next level as a black person. We're shifting. We're shifting now. And some people are coming along with the shift and some people are not. And that shift goes into where people can bring their full selves. And they're, if they're not a allowed to bring their full selves, then they go look somewhere else. And now hindsight is 2020. So we see some of the mistakes that some of the traditional op religious options choices have made when we talk about um, getting teen girls pregnant, when we talk to, and then throwing them out of, you know, your particular religion. When we talk about, um, you know, letting uh, like the minister of music, you, you shame him about what he does at home, but um, you know, you let him play the, play the organ. We, we, we see these hypocritical kind of 
things happening okay. and millennials are like, uh, we, we, you, you taking away your power. We're not saying that's not okay. We're not gonna, um, um, let you hold those, right. those two things and contradictory things. And we're calling you out about it. And if you're trying to force us out of the church, we'll just go find something else. And I think that's what we're doing. Yeah. We're finding other options, finding other options to attach ourselves to since this one is not being real. Traditional, um, like religious spaces, I agree. Because even here in Dallas and even when I was in DC, there's like this um, movement of, of, of millennials leaving the mosque but we're setting up like our own individual mm -hmm. groups now. Mm -hmm. yes. So we're meeting in homes, like it's packed crowded. Like there's one place that I go to here in Dallas and there's so many people that come, they spill out into the parking lot. Like there's not enough room, but, but these people, most of them don't feel comfortable going to the mosque because they don't wear a scarf or maybe they have a boyfriend or maybe they're lesbian or there's so many issues that the mosque isn't prepared to deal with sometimes mm -hmm. that these other spaces are accepting of and dealing with and addressing and talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what elements, if any, do we still find life affirming or liberating in traditional expressions of black religion? What I find is the joy and the music and the celebration um, that black folk bring to the table that no other tradition mm -hmm. has. And that, I think, is something that you, you just can't find it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. That when you go to a church, and I love to go to church, even though it's not my message, <laughs> <laughs> but the music, the music and the joy of the people and the embrace that you get from people when you come in mm -hmm. is something really powerful. That's so I would true. say, I would say there's there's much that is affirming and life giving about black religious spaces across the diversity of those spaces. We really have to name how racism and white supremacy and the hell that we just catch right. from walking around in these right. bodies, literally yeah. just yes. from walking around in our bodies, exhaust us, yes. Yes. wears us down, yeah. um, tires our spirit. Mm -hmm. um, these are just death dealing circumstances mm -hmm. in this country that we call home. Mm -hmm. Our religious spaces, mm -hmm. wherever they are, right? Whether they're the formal spaces or whether they're just the informal meals that we might have with some like-minded folks, remind us of our humanity right. mm -hmm. in the world that is constantly um, trying to kill us, mm -hmm. literally trying right. to kill us. Um, and so I'm not suggesting it has to be the church or the mosque or the synagogue. It, it doesn't matter. It is just where the spaces where the sense of black humanity and dignity can be restored when the forces and powers and principalities are constantly attacking that, those are spiritual and sacred spaces. Right. And so to the extent to which we have <laughs> spiritual and sacred spaces and we absolutely need them. Some of them are in healthy congregations and healthy churches and healthy mosques. Some of them are other alternative uh, spaces, but they're sacred. And so there's a way that we have to talk about sacred spaces and not just the space of the religious, by which we mean certain kinds of traditional practices that are connected to doctrine. Um, we have to have our sacred spaces in, in this particular historical. So th this is why our ancestors, right? This is why they prayed. Th this is why we continue to pray to whomever. Um, but there's something sacred about the gathering of black people together mm -hmm. that is the affirmation of our dignity and the world that has legally and systematically tried to deny it. So Frederick Douglass says he didn't learn didn't learn the meaning of prayer until he prayed with his legs, mm -hmm. right? So we live in a context in which black bodies are despised. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that black churches at their worst have had a love-hate relationship with these bodies, mm. right? They don't really mm. value these bodies. If they did, we'd have a different conversation concerning sex and sexuality, right? right? Mm. But they don't value these bodies. And it seems to me, theologically, this, this gets expressed through the depiction and understanding of Christ. Jesus is without a penis, mm. right? Mm. So if you wanna get in trouble, wrestle with questions concerning how Jesus used that penis, mm. right? Who was pleasured by it and how did he receive pleasure? Right. So he's he's a, a being without some of these fundamental yearnings and desires that mark our lives. And so these churches don't provide us with a way 
to appreciate these bodies as the sources of pleasure. The kind of erotic dimension of embodiment is completely lost. Mm. And, and, that, and I think that's critical because when I, when I was a Christian minister, one thing that I noticed about myself, one thing that I discovered after I was introduced to mindfulness and meditation practices is, is that I really hated my body mm. because, because from what I was communicated through teachings, Christian teachings and mm -hmm. through personal study of, of the Bible was that um, the body was fleshly. It, 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 was, it was worldly um, and that I was to rise and transcend the body so that mm -hmm. I could meet, so that I could um, achieve a certain spiritual relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that interpretation, what I noticed is that sexuality, uh, pleasure, um, you know, how, just anything relating to the body, uh, sensuality, desires in the body, all of those, I had, I had labeled those to be um, um, not sacred. Mm -hmm. So with meditation practices provided for me was, I was able to look at my existing beliefs about myself, who I am and my body, and where I receive those ideas about who, where those ideas came from, look at those clearly without judging them and also begin to create space so that I could redefine my body. I could redefine how I needed to relate to my body. I could redefine what was sacred for me. To the extent of, of W.E. Du Bois and Souls of Black Folk, uh, while dated now, he did at one point say in particular, the Amy Church was the greatest Negro organization in the world. And I think he said that not so much because of its theological commitments or dogma, but as a fierce defender of black bodies. I don't know that there's any other institution in the world or in America today, and I'm speaking kind of uh, generally speaking of the black church, that's been such a major defender of black life and works to preserve the presence of black people in the world. Um, even with all its flaws, and there, there are a number of flaws, I think that's true of any institution that's led by humans. But to this day, if we need to mobilize for a cause of justice, if we need to stand against the scourge of white supremacy, there are few institutions that are fortified enough and have such a historical rooting as a black church to provide us that space. And that's true whether or not you've grown up in the church or not. I've seen that even in activist spaces where uh, the question often is, where can we gather? Where can we mobilize? Where can we organize for this work? And whether or not you're an adherent of the faith or not, this is still the place we gather. Unfortunately, when we got to bury our brothers and sisters uh, who have been uh, harmed by police brutality and other of issues, it's often in the black church that we gather. Uh, when we are responding politically, when we are organizing, again, it's a black church. Uh, whether that will remain the same, uh, going forward is a question for us to ask. But as you're asking of the value of the traditional church, I think those are two ways in this church has been valuable. Mm. I, I'd want to respectfully disagree. challenge some yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm. it, it seems yeah. to me on one level, Black Lives Matter indicates that you don't need the same sort of institutional presence in order to get work done. Right. You just need an internet connection, <laughs> right? So you, you mentioned W.E.B. Du Bois, but he also laments the failure of black churches to engage in a way that is useful. So if you read Souls of Black Folk and look at the story of John, education fails John, and the black church doesn't pick John's liberative message they stick with the status quo, mm. right? So Du Bois is raising some <coughs> questions concerning the viability of the black church. It seems to me on some level, millennials come of age in a context in which the American dream is dead. Mm. And what they get with the black church is the radical rise, the radical reemergence of the prosperity gospel. Neither provides for a full sense of being in the world. It's a shortcut or cheap grace with respect to how we answer the fundamental questions of our existence. Who are we? What are we? When are we? Why are we? I and think, I, think, I think a question then, uh, and I can only speak out of my experience, whether we have been in rallies, whether we've been in protests, whether we have been engaged in acts of civil disobedience, 
even amongst millennials who are outside of organized traditions of faith, when they find an authentic presence of, of faith leaders, uh, churchgoers who are willing to be present, there's been an embrace and even space made for that worldview. And so I don't necessarily believe uh, that the church uh, is ineffective in moving in these spaces. I, I think the challenge oftentimes for the church is we feel like we have to control the spaces. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes it's how you show up in the space. But I have found persons uh, in the public square who are not necessarily faith adherents, who have been willing to offer a ready embrace of those who've been willing to join them in the work. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's valuable. I mean, in, in the church, of course, we're, we're, yeah, yeah. And I, I think, you know, the challenge in talking about the black church all the time is that you can get into these notions, these normative notions that we're monolithic, right? Uh, Carrie Day already told us that only 10 to 13 percent of black churches were engaged in a poor people's campaign. Right. So we can't necessarily speak that everybody was showing up. But there is a tradition of showing up for people and standing with people that I think is valuable, mm -hmm. even in this Black Lives Matter Ferguson era. And I find something interesting, you know, talked about the value of the, tr of the church. But I remember Jesse Jackson <clears throat> seeking to raise funds for the movement, uh, standing before the people and saying, you know, we need to gain some resources, which is something we know is within the tradition of black church, all the way from the bus boycotts and beyond. When the people gather, regardless of what's going on, when you're organizing, you need money for movement. And I, I don't know if it was a generational bar barrier or suspicions of his own person, but it was negatively received. He was, he was booed. Uh, uh, why are you trying to raise money? Now, conversely, there was a situation that was Black Lives Matter led, if you will, in our area, uh, where some young girls were accosted in McKinney, Texas. Some of you remember that yeah. at the swimming pool. Mm -hmm. And there, were, there was monies that were needed. And although there were thousands of people gathered in the space, my understanding from the organizers was that they only raised $200, right? Now, the reason I'm making these connections is that there's a genius from the traditional black church in terms of organizing and gathering corporate wealth to move forward movements that I have not always seen manifested amongst millennials. And so to the question, what is the value of traditional church in today's space? I think some of that value still is in terms of how do you organize and maintain some longevity of movement to bring about change, right? Uh, for everything we can say about the historic civil rights movement and all its failures and issues, we can also note that they were effective in bringing about some national change to policy. Black Lives Matter, as much as I enjoy it and feel like I'm a part of it and moving forward, to some extent, we've yet to receive or arrive at that radical change that brings about the shift to public policy. But I think you're missing the point, right, on, on two scores, that what you get with Black Lives Matter, this new mode of, 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 of activism is a rejection of the kind of hierarchical mm -hmm. process of leadership That's and movement That's that you get with the black church. It also seems to me what you get with millennials is a challenge to the assumption that the only way to think about struggle as useful is through an outcome driven strategy. So I don't see Black Lives Matter as being as concerned with outcomes and much more concerned with the troubling of how we even think and talk about issues. I, I, I think that, I just, I think that there, there's some, something in the data that I think speaks to the tension that we, that we're hearing in this conversation, which is that if you, if you poll black millennials, you, the majority of them still say that the, that, that churches and houses of worship do more good than harm. That on the, on the, on the, on the whole, they're a positive force in society. But they're much more likely than, the, than older generations to, to have that reverse I idea, to say that, no, actually, they do more harm than good. Mm -hmm. Actually, they're pulling us apart. Actually, they're, they're, they cause problems to, the, to our perception of morality, not help our perception of morality. So on the one hand, it's still the, the, the majority view, even among millennials, that, that the church is helpful, that the church is a productive place, that the church can help us. But there's a lot more skepticism and there's a lot more sort of questioning and there's a lot more challenge among this, this younger generation than there were among their elders. Just the idea that you, the beginning of your statement about how the church put out a particular um, image of blackness, it is a very, very particular image of blackness that a lot of people don't fit in. And if they don't fit in that perfect um, way of being black, they were thrown away. That's not... Um, 
And I think millennials, we're not, we know, we're not throwing people away. We know that there's value in people outside of that respectable, nice, upstanding, um, perfect, patriarchal, man, woman type of deal. Like we, that works for some people, but that doesn't work for all blackness. So when we talk about Black Lives Matter, it has to be all of us. And if you're not including all of us, then we find something else to do. And so when we look at somebody who, who like Jesse Jackson, we don't trust you. You see what I'm saying? We don't trust you. And so you're raising money and you had all these issues and we just don't trust it. And so when we see you raise the money, we, even though that's a perfect point that, you know, there could be somebody who's wonderful, who can fundraise and do all of these things, but you, we know your history. Al Sharpton, we know your history. When we see all of these people, we know your history. We don't trust you, so go sit down. What I appreciate most um, about this day is black millennials are calling the church to be better um, and to return to um, the better parts of itself and evolve in other areas that we haven't seen before. Um, the United Methodist Church put out an article saying uh, one of the top things that millennials did not want to hear in the pulpit was politics and type justice type work. When I researched black millennials, one of the top three things they wanted to hear in the pulpit was justice. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we're demanding more of the black church and those who listen will grow, will evolve and will flourish. And those who want will unfortunately dwindle if not die. And so I think when we talk about the black church, we almost have to go like in decades, like which decade of the black church, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I also understand Dr. Waters because if you grew up um, with the mother from Grenada, Mississippi, whose cousin housed uh, Dr. King and, you know, who, I mean, she was director of the welfare reform program under OIC and, you know, the, the initiative they were attempting. I went to black churches like the ones he's saying. There are a great number of millennials who never saw a black church like that and still had white Jesus and still, you know, participated greatly in the politics of respectability. Um, and, you know, I mean, they just everybody just doesn't know our version of the black church that, that you're speaking of. And I think we should see more of that. But many people haven't. People have seen evangelical churches in black face way too much. Yeah. And that's a great reason not to trust the black church. Um, you know, even outside of the Jesse Jacksons and Al Sharptons, we've had enough people who were silent. And think about it. Millennials before Mike Brown, Trayvon Martin were a different generation. Mm -hmm. I remember the generation before us saying, hey, we have not arrived. You have not arrived. You, you know what I mean? Like you are not. They don't see you as their equals. You have to work hard. And we were kind of like, no, no, because when I talk to my friends, they say, you know, and we were trying to be. Um, we thought the world had progressed in ways it hadn't. And then Mike Brown, Trayvon Martin. So then we're like, oh, you know what? They don't see us as equals. Let's go on the street and burn the country down. And then the older generation was like, no, no, no. You know what I mean? You're too woke. So it's like, you want me to sleep or you want me to take a nap? <laughs> you know, what do you want from me in this moment? And so we woke up in a different kind of way with a whole lot of energy. We were ready to be radical. And I think the generations really weren't on the same pages. And then we were like, okay, so where is the black church that we've read about. We want to see that black church. And we haven't arrived. We, we still have a lot of work to do, but I, I will say without doubt, based on research and experience, black millennials are demanding more from the church, whether they are practicing Christians and believers or not. The church has a role that we believe we have historically heard about or read about, and we want to see that church show up. Well, when speaking about black faith, all the conversations I'm hearing at, at this nice table, are basically saying there is a lack, from what I'm getting, a lack of historical context and, a, and making a solid and concrete cultural connection. When you do that in the aspect of just blackness as being the center of all, whether you talk about black church, the, the masjid, the mosque, synagogue, whatever, if you don't put that blackness or that black experience as the centerpiece of it to connect the historical mm -hmm. as well as the cultural, then you're gonna be missing a whole lot of things. Absolutely. When you, you know, and for example, there were Muslims during the time of, of slavery, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like Abdul Qadir Kane and Umar Tal, that united to keep out Arabs, to keep out white folks and other people who were coming in trading on black bodies. And as long as they were united on their Islamic pilgrimage or whatever faith, they couldn't get slaves out of that region. Now, of course, we all know how that ended because that's why we all up ended here. Mm -hmm. But when you 
reject a lot of that historical context that can be beneficial of other areas and other experiences, you're putting yourself out of an element. Carter G. Woodson, the father of black history, modern day father of black history, said in his book, Miseducation of the Negro, that Tariq as Sudan, which is Arabic for the history of Sudan, needs to be to black people what uh, Shakespeare is to white folks. But yet the majority of black people have not heard of that, never read it, because culturally they're not connected to it and therefore they can't get any historical benefit from it. So when we look at all of these and going back to the point of say Jesse Jackson getting booed, he's getting booed because the people who are booing him don't understand the historical connection of the positive that he did, but he will get acknowledged on the fact of some of the things that he may have done that has been good. But when you look at some of the things that he has done that may have compromised <coughs> future generations, those future generations are gonna say, go ahead and sit down. You know, we wanna take from you your wisdom, but allow us to step forward and then give us the support that you got. A lot of people, a lot of preachers who claim Dr. King now would not let him speak in their church. And now they're okay, everybody's gotta do an MLK Day promotion for Sunday school. Well, if you're promoting that geopolitically, socioeconomically, what is the gain to be gotten from that? So I think if we put that in the center, that's the thing that we're forgetting about here. I'd like to approach this through the, through the lens of talking about what our sacred sources are. Um, and I'm thinking about my experience of being the parent of a brilliant 14 year old child. So Generation Z. And what my wife and I have attempted to do while we're rooted in a Christian grammar, we are also m wonderfully open to all that is African traditional religion, right? And not having this sacred secular split. So in terms of the embodiment issue with when raising a 14 year old young lady, what is life giving is a religious understanding of the drum, or we talk all the time in our house about the funk, mm -hmm. right? That way in which in the rhythm and blues and the, in the tradition of jazz and the tradition of hip hop, there is this, this swag and this, right, this way of saying, I am here. <coughs> and so what I think is wonderful about black religious spaces when they're not um, co-opted by one particular tradition mm -hmm. is to say that black people know how to show up in their bodies and say, I'm here. And that I'm here has a way of disrupting evil. I'm here. So we talk a lot about the funk. The funk is, and that's right out of this womanist tradition. I don't, it was when I was uh, really beginning to think about being a daddy. I was working my way again through Zora Neale Hurston and the way in which she talks about embodiment. <coughs> so to talk about the drum or the funk or I'm here, that is powerful sacred work. And black religious traditions know how to inculcate that when they're at their best. So there's a certain notion that's given to the black church as a whole, I think without acknowledging the good that is still done with the institution. You have to look at them both and look at them through clear eyes. For instance, the amount of gap funding that is provided to our community every single week by black churches is phenomenal, meaning that people are able to stay in their homes able to bail out folk from jail, able to have food on their table that week. That is a phenomenal contribution to the daily lived in realities, particularly of, of, of poor black people, which I really think when we talk about the issues in the black church today, we need to really emphasize more of the socioeconomic challenges and difficulties. I pastor in, a, in one of the most impoverished communities in America, and I see the churches in our community in the work that they do, in the contributions that they made. Many of these pastors, bivocational, many of them without a theological education, yet if the, the meager resources of that church were not immediately returned to that community, that pain would be all the more realized. And so I'm unwilling to uh, push the black church aside because I recognize that if you take all the black churches out of South Dallas, take all the black churches out of the south side of Chicago or any other space that you name, there are people who are literally living at the margins who would know that immediately because they would not be fed that day or they would not have a roof over their head. So with the critique, and it's always an important critique, I mean, I think every Jesus critiqued the church. I mean, a critique of the church is a healthy conversation. But to suggest to me, 
uh, particularly with the traditional church, that there's uh, no value or no uh, daily uh, contribution that is life-giving and life-affirming. I'm challenged by that. What I, I would that, um, question is, is it, is it yeah. the, you describing to me, what you described earlier now, is really the black kitchen. Because where black women, um, black women, that is like their domain in, in the sense where we talk about what the movements, when we give, I can feel comfortable coming into uh, any black woman's house and she's gonna feed me, she's gonna be nice. Even if we disagree on what I, oh, our particular life, I've been in places where I couldn't go into a church, but I can come into this black woman's kitchen and even though she didn't agree with me, she still fed me. Mm -hmm. And so there are certain things that what you describe, I just don't see it. I just, you, there might be some people out here doing stuff like that, but who has access to that resource? Can I come and get fed at your church without having to change clothes? Can I come and get a, get my light bill paid? I know my, my mother who may perform cis-heteronormativity a certain specific way can come and get some of that light bill money paid. But me, as a, a trans black woman who is proud about who I am, I can't come do the same thing. So those resources may be good for a group of certain people. It's not good for everybody, especially the people who literally are on the margins. It's just, it just doesn't work. And I think that this will, exactly what we're doing right now, this is what the issue is. Because we're talking, it's like now we're in a defense position. And I think that's what happens with masjids, with churches, with synagogues, is once we start to talk about things that are not okay with us, then everyone tenses up. And we're just like, well, we're not bad, we're not bad. But we're not saying it's all bad, but there are some things that we need to deal with. And those are the reasons why people aren't coming to the table anymore. Because there's that hesitancy there. So once we start to bridge this divide, then we're going to have more people, I believe, come back to the table. But until people are able to open their eyes and say, hey, you know what? We need to listen a little bit deeper, listen a little bit more. And let's start to, to see some action and let's stop just talking about how great we are. Let's be great. Sure. And when my Isha Booker was killed here in Dallas, <clears throat> I had a chance to address pastors at a pastor's luncheon at Methodist Hospital. And in naming the victims of violence within our community, we lifted up that name and all the persons within our community. Dallas is notorious for that. And not only would we name her death, but we name the forces that have moved her and others out of Oak Lawn, because we know that even for black trans persons, or LGBTQI persons, there's white supremacy operating in those spaces as well. That there's not a freedom of mobility, even within those communities. That there's almost a fetishism of blackness in those spaces. And we understand that she and others were pushed out of that area many times in the South Dallas and that violence came. And so I think there's also an issue of assumption. There's an <laughs> assumption given for black churches, who would be welcomed, who would be received, right? Congregations like mine and many others, we've given food and clothing, shelter, support, financial to all persons, regardless of their background. But I also hear something, I think that's very important, that the church is not done has been to be mindful of the trauma that is caused and the hurt and harm that has been given in to create tables and spaces like this to discuss that. So again, my, my issue to your point is not so much a, a holistic defense of the traditional church because there's a lot that has been done wrong, good things to be done wrong, but I think it has to be balanced at the same time, a celebration of the things that are being done well. And by lifting those two things up together, we can get to a better place. And I think that started with us as individuals. like. If you think about our um, the millennials, like how many of us have therapists now? You know, that's something that's unheard of. I have a therapist. I have two, you know, um, you know, so we have therapists now. So once you start to deal and process with your issues and your healing, you're not going back to the person who harmed you or to the thing that harmed you. And sometimes that's a mosque. Sometimes that's the church. So they need to start to accept these things that people aren't coming back to get reharmed. So how can we help and how can we go along with them in this journey? I see the reality of <clears throat> all of us and what we, you know, come from in the center is that we were put into a place where we were guaranteed to be 60% or three fifths of a human being. So everything that we do and represent is trying to get that other 40% so that we will be seen and treated in all spaces as 100% of a human being. So if we focused on that as the, the point of organization or structural companionship or partnering teams and things of that sort, 
mutual assistance in terms of ensuring human rights for all of us would be there, I think. And that's the thing I don't see too much. I think we get distracted off of that a little bit. And how are we going to address the trauma or the post-traumatic trauma of each other? And we can't address the trauma that we're still recovering from. 400 years descended on. And I think so one of the ways that we can address such trauma is to not just think of the negative things, because it's easy, we're humans. That's what we're going to do, because we're human beings, we're on this plane. We're uh, the, what the imperfect eye observes in perfection, right? And if you want to have a more perfect vision, you'll start to see perfections more so than imperfection. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about earlier. You mentioned W.B. Du Bois. Um, one of his religious affiliations was the Baha'i faith. He and his wife were Baha'is. He uh, published Abdul Baha in the crisis. He had a full page dedicated to him. And he said things like, if there was a faith that would represent blacks in a way that he, he would like to see, it would be the Baha'i faith. He was more radical in his uh, approaches than uh, the Baha'is are it, it just the way it was at that time because it wasn't really well known in the states in the early 1900s. But aside from that, he that was his only critique was just I wish it would go it could go faster what he's speaking what the religious um, texts dictate. And so if we begin to think of each other each as a protagonist on the same path of justice, right? Because justice is a child of love when you think about it. If there is no love, there is no justice, and if we start to begin, we're on this path here, sitting at this table. We are each a protagonist on this path. We each have something to contribute. Whatever unique ability that is, whatever talent that is, we each have something. And if you aren't able to fully express yourself because you feel like someone's judging you or someone prejudged you or someone judged you after you said something or whatever, you know, then that's where we start getting into our own way. That's where somebody's like, I'm stopping right here. They're no longer walking down that same path. Or that's when someone breaks off and creates a path. And that is what I think that if we start thinking about a world embracing view more so than just, hey, you come into me. This is where my building is. This is where we have service or whatever the case is. A lot of times people aren't going to necessarily do that as we, were, we discussed earlier. But when it's something where, hey, I'm having a devotional in my house. The theme's going to be equality of men and women. Are you interested in coming? You'd be like, yeah, you know what? You're my friend. Maybe I would come to your house, you know? And in those small conversations, in that grassroots uh, approach, that's where we have just like this. This is what is this? What building is this? You know what I mean? Those grassroots conversations are where people feel important or where people feel like they're heard. And it's, it's at that level where the individual can be transformed the family can change. And then that's when society and the institutions begin to start getting broken down. The things that happen, integration and disintegration. You have positive and negative things happening. The forces are always happening at the same time. And so when we see a breakdown in something in society, that is a form of disintegration. And so when we see these millennials stepping away from the church and maybe just not having anything to necessarily adhere to, but they are still somehow spiritual and religious, that's the integration part. We're human beings. What animates us is our soul. That makes us dual beings. That's what separates us from the animal kingdom. Our relationship, be able to have a relationship with God is what separates us. And so why not come in spaces where we feel safe? Why not come in spaces where we feel like we're heard and be protagonists on the same path to justice? We've been talking about community. Um, and I want to harp on this as we were talking about the black community and, and something that's really impacting our community is gentrification. Um, mm -hmm. And so gentrification is becoming synonymous with our black urban centers across the country. Do you believe organized black religious spaces did enough to combat this issue? Um, what, if anything, can black religious and spiritual communities do uh, at this point, some would say it's too late to combat issues of gentrification in our communities. You all have been talking about what the black religious spaces have been for black people in these communities, but many of these people no longer live in the communities where these spaces are located. Um, so what, what, how do we respond to that? Or what's going on and what are you hearing? In New Orleans, one of our churches started a nonprofit to revitalize 
uh, housing to utilize grant funding. Uh, but we had to do it as, with a nonprofit so that the religion and the, the state wouldn't be caught up. And so we earmarked those spaces, those homes, uh, the apartment buildings for affordable housing uh, so that you keep people there regardless of creed, regardless of sexual orientation or whatever, who those spaces were built by um, across from my, my own parish. There was a home that was valued at $80,000 two years ago and was sold for $250,000. And I really wanted that, that house so that we could keep it at its valuation, but we didn't have the resources at the time to get that. But so we need to do some of that pooling uh, of resources to invest in our communities. Um, and I think that's the way we, we do it. Some places we've done it well and other places we haven't. And sometimes it's the black church that sells the space and says, well, let's move to the other side of town because we have come up of age and, <coughs> and we're not doctors and lawyers and, and we don't want to live in the hood anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think we need to just reconnect and it's never too late to reclaim what's ours. I think it goes back to understanding our value too in our communities. Because for me growing up, um, I, I can always remember like, oh, you know, you grow up and you make more money and you get out the hood. That's just how it was. So that has always been my thought process. So it's not until late that I've been like, oh, you know, this is a valuable place to be. I want to live by my grandma, you know, like I didn't see the value in it, honestly. So now, unfortunately, that other people are starting to see the value in our community, I'm a little bit late. Yeah. So I think that is what has happened in our communities. So I was gonna say, um, one of the things I think we need to do is actually stop calling it gentrification. Mm. Um, living in Washington, D.C. now, which um, has mm. suffered some of the worst effects of gentrification, I'm really, co I'm really coming to understand it as cultural displacement and perhaps mm -hmm. even cultural genocide, mm -hmm. which is, it's not simply the removal of black peoples, mm -hmm. but histories mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. come along yeah. with these neighborhoods and these houses and these places of, of worship, um, stories, um, um, our past. Um, what we know about a place like Black Wall Street, our forebearers knew because they told the stories to each other. Mm -hmm. It's only been fairly recently that somebody was interested enough to write it down, right, into the historical record. So when there is cultural displacement, you lose so much history, so many stories, so many power of pow the power of what these spaces have provided for Black folk. And while I agree that I don't know if we can lay the responsibility of it only at one person's door, I simply have to say that it's important for me that we really rename it and call it what it is, mm -hmm. because then maybe we'll see the necessity of preserving either some of these institutions, some of these places, some of these um, neighborhoods, some, some of these houses. Um, we're losing more than we're gaining at any particular moment. We're, we're losing our elders, but we're also losing literally the places where our elders walked. Mm -hmm. And so what happens to a people when they're losing their physical history in addition, right, um, um, to, to some of our forebears? Washington, D.C. is challenged by this, as are um, some of the other cities where the housing values have skyrocketed. You named $250,000. I was like, you could not buy an outhouse no. in Washington, D.C. for $250,000. I'm, I'm moving to well, New Orleans, it might right? Be as big as an and it might, so don't right, I won't get too excited. <laughs> I'm excited. Um, but it also means that we want to have to have real conversations in our religious communities about capitalism. Yeah. Yes. We don't want to talk about capitalism. Mm -hmm. We don't want to talk about capitalism itself as genocide for black people sometimes. We don't want to talk about socialism. We don't want to talk about these other pieces that come along with what gentrification actually represents for our community. Um, and all of our faith traditions, many of us are so upwardly mobile. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who are we leaving behind? Yeah. And why are we running? Right, right. And from what are we running? Yeah. And I think if we were to really sort of take a little time there, um, we'd stop calling it gentrification. It's killing us. I agree with it's you. It's killing our stories. Like yeah. my, my, where I'm from, Port Arthur, um, my, it's my grandmother's house. Next door was my cousin's house. Next door was her sister's house. 
and then the house over we were all related on that block so I remember like maybe 10 years ago my grandma my aunt is passed and stuff and she's like oh somebody needs to buy that house or take care of that lot and I didn't understand like the value of it so the city came toward the house down now it's their land again but they spent all their hard money purchasing these homes like they my grandma was the first black person to move to this side of town and then it drove all of the white people out little by little so now I'm starting to see the value, but I didn't see it's it. It's a white migration. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah. It's, it's they were running out. It's a white migration <clears throat> coming in. Yeah. And what the people, them coming in, now they're using the state. That's why they're calling the police. Mm -hmm. They're trying to use the policies mm -hmm. that are set into in, in place exactly. to police us mm -hmm. in the places that they ran out of. Right. And now they're coming back. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to talk about uh, gentrification without talking about redlining. Mm -hmm. Right. The, they're... they're kind of hand in hand yeah. and this intentional disenfranchisement that is historic and ongoing and uh, even economic terrorism you mentioned black wall street i mean unfortunately there are a number of black wall streets all across oh, america mm -hmm. right where there was a a, a forceful uh, prohibition of of earning a living and providing for your family in our experience it's very hard to call it gentrification in a sense because uh, only 20% of the persons who actually live in the area own their property, right? right? And so it's, it's, it's properties that, you know, we may have grown up in or been around, but the ownership has never been with the people. And to, to that extent, I think we have to have a greater conversation of the effects of the American Civil Rights Movement. Right. And what we do know is those who benefited the most were those of means and mobility to take advantage of the access given. And what happened was that we left the most marginalized, oppressed, and poor of our brothers and sisters largely to fend for themselves. And that, to me, that's a great critique of black people to some extent and of the black church. And kind of putting that in the context of, of scripture, you know, the priests stand in the middle of the Jordan River till everybody makes it over safely to the other side. And to many extent, I believe that, you know, generations before, stayed in the middle of the river until those of means made it to the other side. <coughs> and then they said, that's enough. And they left our brothers and sisters wow, to heavy. drown in the water, right? Yes. So I, that, that, that's on us. And I think taking a, a, a step even further back, it's because at some point or another, success was identified as whiteness, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, once, once the doors are open, you show that you have arrived because you are able to abide in white spaces. Mm -hmm. And that speaks to how harmful white supremacy passed on mm -hmm. as faith has been to our people. Mm -hmm. To hear Dean Pierce talk about this with a new grammar, I'm gonna call it cultural displacement. Mm -hmm. What that does for me, it, it reminds us that there are cultural realities and economic realities. Right. And so I think the antidote, being married to a financial planner, <laughs> one of the things that I realize is the number of times I've heard seasoned clergy, some of the real superstars who've done great work, but who have come to the end of their very socially oriented and engaged ministries broke because theologically money was evil that there was a storytelling around money that made resources something that we should not be questing for in a positive way. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I find, so do the cultural work, mm -hmm. I remind folks all the time that in Christian scripture, there is this textual variant, right? So it didn't make it into the main text, it's in the footnote, <laughs> but that's where the juice <laughs> often is, is in the footnote. I often remind people about the economics and the mm -hmm. politics of prophetic movements. So there's the story of these two very powerful women, Mary, who sits at the feet of Jesus. She's the one that goes to seminary. But there's a little textual variant that says her sister, Martha, owned the house in which Jesus led the seminar. So, so often we focus on our religious communities in terms of who the disciples are, where we need to spend some time raising up some trustees oh, no. who can create prophetic houses to block the gentrification. Mm -hmm. So to tell different kinds of stories mm -hmm. that the allocation and holy redistribution of resources is sacred work. Mm -hmm. And then to empower people. So literally to have some worship services where you teaching folks how to read spreadsheets mm -hmm. and to do that work and take the shame element 
away from our money practices. So I think we have to be much more, along with Dr. Braxton, we have to be much more strategic. Like when I served a church for 10 years here, a mega church, I remember we got to the point where we were trying to buy other land and just talking about all the mistakes we made in our attempt to, um, and I mean, we went from one part of the hood to the other part of the hood, so we weren't going to any white space. <clears throat> but as soon as we put money down to buy that land, everything around it shot up. <clears throat> we did a disservice to our community, <clears throat> excuse me, and to ourselves. If we would have been wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove, we would have bought up property around it before laying, you know, stake on something very expensive. Mm -hmm. But who knew? We didn't. We had no idea. And so not only did we make it difficult for us to buy back the block, as PJ Morton, you know, just mm -hmm. saying, mm -hmm. but we also did a disservice to our community by putting this high $30 million property in the middle of the hood and all of a sudden white eyes, you know, opened and they were like, mm, we got this, you know? Mm -hmm. So sometimes I know we don't always have the resources, but we need to, if the church or the community center can't do it, that we find the wealthy uh, right. people from our community right. who are allies and say, this is what we need to do. I had a potential client who said, who was so excited because a company wanted to buy their church and buy them out of their space. They held out for a while. So I think they were getting like more than $10 million for their space. And I said, well, I, I can't stop you from doing what you want to do, but what's next? He told me about the amazing facility they were going to build. I'm like, so how long y'all going to stay there before the same thing happens? Can we at least be strategic enough for you to buy up space around it so this doesn't happen again in 30 years? Like, I think, you know, even now we're like, taking the money and running with it to go build a state-of-the-art facility, and we're doing the same thing over when they're moving us out, even when they do pay us, I'll say decently, because we know it's not well based on what they're going to make. We're making the same mistakes, and I'm with you, Dr. Braxton, like, dang, when is devotional going to come into a business type, um, you know, setting, or when are we going to learn more than just how to raise funds, but what to do with our resources so that we're amazing stewards of what God has given us. And it doesn't just benefit one house, but it benefits all the houses in the community. Mm -hmm. So somebody needs to come and run a business revival in some black churches and black faith centers so that we're not making the same mistake again, because some people have watched the superstars and they're doing the same thing and they think it's right, and they think it's righteous, and they think it's going to benefit them ways that it never will. And we're too embarrassed to say we made a mistake from the jump. So I'm gonna stop us there. This has been uh, a good first half of our conversation. We, I had a bunch of questions more to ask, but we have some more uh, time for dessert and for some more deep conversation around this. So when we come back, uh, we'll continue this conversation, this intergenerational conversation around Black millennials and faith, and how do we move forward in really transitioning? How do we move forward um, when we talk about intergenerational conversation, when we talk about intergenerational dialogue, when we talk about community building uh, and our way forward in the future? Welcome back to the second half of our conversation. It's time for dessert. Are y'all ready for dessert? Yes. yes. I am too. The conversation has been so robust. Uh, make sure that you're following this conversation uh, using the hashtag God Talk, hashtag Black Faith, and be sure to follow the museum uh, on Twitter, on Instagram, uh, to continue the conversation and follow along with previous God Talk conversations. So let's jump back into the conversation. I'm excited about this dessert. I don't know about y'all, but so I'm ready excited. to eat. <laughs> but I know there's some great conversation that we can have over dessert. Mm -hmm. um, so my first question as we're thinking about and, and as we left off, many of the reasons that millennials are disengaging with religion is the constrictors or range of expression of human sexuality. Uh, can you react to that? Do you see gender and sexuality playing a role in why black millennials are choosing to disengage with faith and spirituality? Okay, maybe because of the fact that there's a lot of homophobia within the black church 
And people tend to forget that a lot of members of the church are actually gay or maybe other members of the LGBTQ community. So when you're having all of this um, rapid homophobia, it's kind of hard to coexist in a church when everyone has this ideology about you being lesser because of who you are as a human being. So it's hard to um, be who you are in this essence, in this presence, when the very same people that you're trying to be mutuals with or be just friends with or even allies with, you can't do that because, you know, they're having this mindset that they can't, you can't go at six with them. And it supersedes every single thing that I need. When you talk mm -hmm. about, um, when I, I could be coming, looking for something so much more in regards to help. And every, every time that I come to get counseling, you focus in on that, like that is the problem. That's what you need to fix. That's what you, um, you know, that's the issue. I remember when I was nine, that the, the, they thought taking me to a boys camp was going to fix everything mm -hmm. because it was going to be nothing but boys. We were going to shoot guns. We were going to fish. We were going to do all the stuff that um, they thought was going to masculinize me. And then when I went into the camp, I could fish better than all the boys because my mama and my grandmother and my great aunts taught me how to fish. <laughs> I could shoot better than all the boys because the, those same women taught me how to shoot. All the things that they deem masculine, women taught me how to do great and I could outdo it all of them, but it didn't masculinize me at all. Mm -hmm. But in that same sense, I couldn't get into the boys club that was the church the church had. I couldn't get in, it, it, I couldn't go and sit next to the deacons like the 18 year old masculine, cis masculine guy could because he performed masculine the same way. So he, the, the perfect way. So they, they would pat him on the back and um, give him all this kind of praise. And I, and I didn't need that praise because I got praise from my mom. I got praise from everybody. But at church, I, I saw a distinct difference between how I was treated and how my mannerisms was policed mm -hmm. compared to how him who was performing <laughs> he was performing masculinity because he was on the download doing stuff mm -hmm. all kinds of crazy stuff right. but he was performing masculinity the way they wanted him to so he was able to get access mm -hmm. to the benefits of what the church extra chicken in the church kitchen <laughs> all the whatever benefits that you could get he was there he was even able to sit in certain places that i wasn't able to sit in so just things that i observed and those little small social things translated to outside of the church, it translated to, I saw it in other churches and it just wasn't, um, wasn't a place for me to grow and bring my full self. It pushed me out of that space. It told me that I didn't belong and I needed to find another religion, some an, other people, another community that said, you are okay. We love you how you are and be who you are. And I couldn't find that in the church. And, and we don't necessarily have that issue because it doesn't come up in terms of, you know, the doctrinal pieces about sexuality or anything. And uh, we have addressed it because it, our teachings of the Buddha says that uh, I don't see this one or that one. All are equal. All are the same to me. I see everybody equally. And so when the issue of same-sex marriage, for example, came up, it was something we addressed to make a policy so that everyone would understand that no matter what your cultural baggage was around that. This is what we as uh, an organization, a religious organization was going to do. And so that we honored same-sex marriage. And even last year, I was asked to make a presentation about LGBTQ, uh, IA and so on and so forth. And I learned a lot uh, without really recognizing why it was so important to them to speak about it because uh, part of the congregation I have to deal with is in Japan. But to really bring home the idea of the equality of all beings, that there is no barrier to anyone being able to take up the path and enter awakening. For me, one constructive approach to these issues of creating really radical welcome that I think is a great quest for many millennials is to take on transgressive practices with how we image the sacred. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we have intentionally done in this uh, community that's questing to be inclusive, of which I'm a part, the Open Church, is to 
do serious intentional work of depicting all that is sacred in feminine terms. And again, you get into some binaries and there, there are challenges with that, but nonetheless, to do the transgressive work. And I had a very supportive male congregant who said, every time you say in your benediction, mama God, it just does something to me, right? It, I'm with you, pastor, I'm with you, but I'm not sure what I'm feeling. And so that led us to, to do some some theological work. And one of the things I said to him is maybe you are actually feeling in your body the beginnings of the birth pangs of giving away your male privilege, mm. that, you, that you are embodying what it feels like yeah. to have to go through the process right, of giving away something, but also giving birth to something else very powerful. So this notion of the embodiment that I think we sometimes as males feel because we've been in charge for so long and the transgressive practices around language can be very constructive for a community and it causes new imaginings to happen. So I offer that as just something <coughs> positive. How do we think about what is sacred and what language do we use to describe what is sacred? And, and one thing that I've witnessed just in my personal experience, um, and from just being around other black folk and black millennials is the idea of, is it possible for there to be such thing as healthy sexuality outside of marriage? Mm. Because most of my guilt and shame and insecurities around sexuality and being a sexual being, which is a part of being a human being, and, and acknowledging that that there has been there has been a lot of a lot of teaching around the scriptures say that this is how sexuality is supposed to look and there there's for me what what that has caused is there to be a lot of conflict within individuals about where well the scriptures say this however this is how sexuality exist in my life um, and, and, and how, how do we talk about that? How do we critique that? How do we examine um, what does healthy sexuality and healthy se sexual expression um, look like and acknowledge how um, sex outside of marriage has been labeled to be sinful and, and how whether or not you're a part of, of a church, a mosque, a Buddhist temple, a synagogue, you don't even have to be a member of that community in order to feel that weight on your shoulders. Um, and to, to actually really, really take time to acknowledge how this causes um, a lot of uh, guilt and suppression that begins to eat away at people's wellness um, in the long run, um, especially um, young people. Um, you know, young people are are, are very clear about the fact that they are sexual beings. And I think it's, it's our responsibility to affirm that um, and to, to let them know that their sexuality is not um, uh, fleshly. There's nothing wrong about their sexuality. And it is sacred, actually. And really giving voice to that and naming that for them. I'd like to go back to something Brad said. It, it seems to me, in part, what you're getting at is a reversal. It's a privileging of the margin. And it seems to me, in, in part, this has to involve a rethinking of the value of our own narratives. So, for example, we might learn more about pleasure, about embodiment, about healthy sexuality from Seely and James Baldwin mm -hmm. than we do from Peter and Paul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this, this conversation also s touches on and speaks to a, a larger question um, that, that we see a lot of, um, especially younger folks are starting to struggle with or starting to challenge, which is not just the church as an institution and pastors and priests and what lines they are or not willing, going to draw, but whether or not sin is a concept they're willing to accept. Mm -hmm. Whether or not a hell existing that God judges people in is appropriate. 
increasingly we see people rejecting the entire, leave aside the question of whether the pastor should be, rejecting the idea that <coughs> God should be putting people into a hell. And so you see people saying, on, on surveys increasingly saying, there, I don't believe that there is a hell. I don't believe hell is, is such a thing. I don't believe that a, a God would do such a thing. And so there's a much more fundamental theological rejection and reimagining that's taking place that goes beyond these questions of institution. I think what's disturbing in the Christian faith is how we've decided to disconnect from our bodies in order to be faithful. Mm -hmm. When I was researching and people knew I was in the survey design um, phase of this, you know, Black Millennial Faith survey, they would say like, make sure you ask them about homosexuality. And I'm like, okay, you know, make sure you ask them about this. And so every time, you know, I would look at the survey and Black Millennials pretty much knew that sexuality wasn't something that they could like rise up against in the church, that they couldn't really have their own views. So it was like a mute, moot point, like don't even deal with that when it comes to the black Christian church. In focus groups, no one brought up sexuality. Like it's just like, it's a pointless conversation for us to have. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. It's not changing, it's not evolving. You know what I mean? It's not even really up for discussion. I mean, it's Kelly Brown Douglas that says we need to really back up off of homosexuality, you know, the conversation around homosexuality until we can really talk about sexuality. Yeah. And since neither one of them can come to the table and like are on the table for real discussion, unfortunately we're, unfortunately, we're divorcing our bodies, you know, for at least in the moments of faith. <clears throat> of course, when we leave, that's a different thing. But when we're in the church, we know what it is. I think it's also imperative that the church gain more courage in direction in addressing sexual trauma. Um, something that we fail to talk about, whether it be through domestic violence, whether it be through sexual assault. <coughs> On any given Sunday, there are men and women who are within our churches who have been impacted by some form of sexual trauma, and yet it goes unaddressed, even to the extent that uh, some churches have been uh, co-conspirators in the continuation of those realities uh, by sending men and women back into relationships where they are harmed, mm -hmm. um, not addressing or calling out uh, this sin from our midst. And I do believe that should be called clearly a sin, uh, how we have harmed children, men and women. Uh, this idea of the Me Too movement uh, is, is, is overdue. And I'm grateful for what's happening in the public square, but clearly, if the lens were turned more directly at the church, we'd find even greater exposure of offenders who have been uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. And so uh, that there is a, it's almost that uh, to some extent, until you're willing to address the trauma calls, you can't even begin the conversation or can't really lean into the conversation about a healthy experience. Because there's so many persons who their whole formation of sexuality of sex, of body, has been impacted by the trauma and harm that they've experienced. And I would, I would <coughs> even say that a lot of, so yes and, um, a lot of trauma comes from reading of scripture that says this is what you should do with your body and this is what you can't. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we have definitely the experience in and, you know, in our bodies, being sexually ab abused and all of those things are forms of trauma. And I think we have to take a time to step back and, and look at our text critically to see how, how when we uphold or remain silent about what our scriptures or our texts say that we hold to be truth or the inherent word of God, that say we should use our bodies in this way, we can't use our bodies in this way, and when we do, then we're sinners, or this is how you, you remain holy, this impacts the psyche in a way that is very detrimental. And I think it's been happening for generations and generations. And as that is passed down, I think that's a form of, of uh, generational trauma as well. I love what you said about um, like this outer body experience when it comes to religion. And easy, even as a Muslim, I can say I've experienced that. Um, so I think it was easier for me to, I, I don't even really think I thought about like someone being gay, someone being les lesbian. I, I didn't really think about it deeply because it didn't directly affect <coughs> me. 
Um, but I grew up with an uncle that I'm very close to who was gay and I loved him to death. And two people in my life who I grew up with are now gay and they're Muslim. So it's really forced me into a space to really start thinking about this. Like, what if I have a child who's gay? Mm -hmm. You know, I've had to have these conversations with myself. And what does that mean to me? What does my faith say about that? What am I going to tell my child? You know, how am I going to treat my child? So I'm so happy to be in this space to really be reflecting and um, digging deep and, and, you know, kind of stepping outside of the moss where these things aren't really talked about and figuring out what's what so I can know how to move forward for myself. We are in an election year. How does your religious or spiritual beliefs impact your political activism? Mm -hmm. Is a candidate's religious affiliation, practice, or belief as important anymore? If so, why? If not, why not? Mm -hmm. What matters to me most, not just out of candidates, but out of anybody else's character, uh, which is basically the system of values and your system of behavior when you know nobody else is around but you. So if there's a candidate that says they're committed to socioeconomic equity and justice, then their policy should be reflected in it the way they divide money and the way they advocate resources to different communities should be reflected in that. So for me, if that commitment to justice is what it is, that's what I'm looking at mm -hmm. for a candidate. Brad talked about the, the nasty, nasty here and now. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's where the church uh, the church's responsibility in the election year starts. Mm -hmm. We care because the here and now is what's affecting our people, our communities. Uh, and when we remain silent about the injustices that are happening in our community, uh, from the federal level, but all the way down to the, the local level, mm -hmm. then we become complicit uh, in that. And so we have to remind our people, and this is something I think millennials do better than older generations, uh, <coughs> that reminder of you have to really know who you're voting for. Uh, even the conversations around uh, Jesse Jackson or, or Al Sharpton, to older generations, they would have wholesale bought in while well, Jesse uh, marched with Martin. And so we gotta uh, stand with him but younger people are saying, I don't care who you march with. What <laughs> yeah, have right. you done? Uh, what are you doing? And so uh, looking at that, it, and not as a church just saying, oh, well, that's my member, so we're going to stand up and, and support them. Mm -hmm. But really saying, what has your member done? Mm -hmm. uh, what has a non-member done uh, to advance the causes that are important to us? So and I wanna, then I want to press us because when you said, oh, this is an election year, mm -hmm. everyone's like, yes. But every year is an election yes. year, yes. Yes. right? Sure. Every year in our respective towns and cities, we vote for school board members. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We vote for some of our local judges. We vote for people whose mm -hmm. political policies have a direct impact on us. We mean, oh, it's a presidential election year. Mm -hmm. but, but part of what we have to really talk about within our communities of faith are politics at the very local level. Absolutely. The people that we elect to a school board have more power mm -hmm. over our children, our babies, right? Our kids and our communities than any state governor or senator. Mm -hmm. And yet we don't show up for that, right? Okay. So the senator, when he is or she is a candidate, they'll come knock on the door of our churches and they're running for this, they're running for governor, they're running for president. And then all of a sudden they want a platform at every black religious organization they can possibly find, including our places of faith. And yet the people who have the most direct impact on the places where we live and where we raise our families, we don't even show up for that. Mm -hmm. So how do we get us to galvanize, to rock the vote, not just every four years, but literally at the local level? Mm -hmm. And how involved are people of faith in local politics? This is where I remind people that a budget, right? A city budget, mm -hmm. a, a, a town budget, a budget is a moral document. Right. So if a budget is a moral document, it tells you where do you place your trust? What do you fund? What don't you fund? What do you care about? What don't you care about? Those are moral choices. And so people of faith have to be involved in moral choices at the local level and not just the larger political level. Again, forces, powers, and principalities. 
I don't, I'm not waiting for the presidential savior to come and save me. That's not going to happen, whoever we elect, right? But I do know that the local level determines how much of our funding for schools comes from the property taxes. And so why do the children in rich neighborhoods, right, have so many resources and the children in poor neighborhoods, those are decisions that we vote on or we fail to vote on. Yeah. Every year is an election year. I've, I've been to the border, been into the detention center. You know, they're kids in cages now. Uh, we have a white supremacist president who has galvanized white supremacists, not just here in America, but all across the world. Um, and there's real harm being done. And uh, I'm concerned of what might happen if people of goodwill disengage from the process and don't vote. I'm concerned of what could occur, what might occur uh, for four more years under this presidency that can continue to create great harm. I think of a judiciary that's been transformed for the next two generations because of this administration and the harm that will continue to happen there. Um, all the things that we can, we can uh, list um, ongoing. And I, I'm concerned that uh, there are people of faith who may not lean into that sacred responsibility. For me, maybe it's centered in my own tradition. You know, I've, I've preached from uh, Brown Chapel Amy Church in Selma. I've had the glory of meeting before she departed here, uh, Dr. Amelia Boynton Robinson, who's nearly killed on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And there's real blood that was spilt for us to engage in this process, not blindly, but to engage and hopefully to transform it for the good. Um, I'm hopeful. Uh, I am a hopeful person that uh, this time we may get the engagement that we need. Um, I'm also mindful that uh, the president alone does not shift the culture or reality of white supremacy and that we have to be engaged on every level. But I also know that this is, I, I think this is a very important election and I'm hoping that uh, our communities will show up. From my own experience, uh, in my faith, we don't have to decide if I'm a Republican or Democratic or anything like mm -hmm. that. I don't have to choose a party, but it is a responsibility and a duty for me to keep up with current events and for me to vote. It is a duty for me. And I can tell you this, um, it's funny you bring this up because just the other day, uh, I was talking to a counselor and a teacher or principal and uh, we were laughing. We we're like, how are we going to get the black people out to vote? I said, man, we're going to pick them up by the bus. We're going to take the bus back around and then provide lunch. Like maybe everybody get a leg and half a biscuit or something, you know, and that's what we're going to do to get people out. They're registered. They're ready. They just don't have the means or wherewithal to go to wherever they're supposed to vote and things like that. And it's different when with the millennials, because we do know, we do know where to go. We do know when we move, we're supposed to update our address mm -hmm. and, you know, do these things and register in the county that we're now living in, et cetera. And so I think, you know, we can do a mixture of both. We don't have to leave all our traditions in the past and think that everybody has to fend for themselves now. We still have to have a sense of community, whether that's with or without a religious group or not. Some things that uh, we have responsibility to are things that don't have really much to do with religion, but they have a lot to do with morals. And speaking of election year being every year, if we want it from, this is from what I've learned. I don't know if things have changed, let me know. Uh, local elections, it is your vote counts. Yeah. Your vote counts at the, at the very grassroots level, the way it's supposed to. Our pop, our presidential election, doesn't go that way. It goes by popular vote, who then those people have electors who are appointed. You can become an elector if you'd like to. But in that sense, let's just say a Republican elector goes to vote. They can pick and choose whichever way they want to. And that's what wins elections here. And that's what they determine it by. That's how they do it. Because we have the electoral college because people weren't educated and couldn't vote and couldn't go out and do those things. Now we do have it where people are a little bit more educated universally is what I'm speaking of, not like higher education or anything like that. And you can go and vote, but we still don't trust the process and our, the way our system is set up, institutionalized. We don't have fair say as far as presidential elections are concerned, but where it does affect us the most, where it does make a difference is exactly what she's saying. And I think we need to help spark the idea in each person that we are each individually responsible. 
Mm -hmm. And that are like, as you were saying, our vote, our presence matters. And if we can create a, a movement of folks taking responsibility for that connection that we all have to what's going on, mm -hmm. that we have to address that every day. You know, I know that we have reason to believe that it doesn't matter because we're being eliminated from voting roles. We're being prevented from voting yeah. as, in as many ways as possible. Mm -hmm. And I always have to think that if they're working that hard to prevent us from voting, right. sure. there's an incredible value to our uh, ability to vote. Mm -hmm. And we have to do something about it. And I think as a leader of a faith tradition that it's up to us to spark that understanding, to spark the desire to be a part of a movement that makes difference happen. As a faith leader, I am embracing in my writing and in my religious practice, political theology. <laughs> we have talked often about the problematic nature of religious texts, scripture, mm -hmm. Christian scripture I'm thinking about in particular. Now, as a scripture scholar, I say all the time that uh, the Bible often misbehaves. <laughs> And when it misbehaves, lots of lives are damaged. Mm -hmm. By the same token, and I think black experience when connected to scripture also bears this out. When read through the lens of hope and survival and liberation, it is a potent document. So in particular, I've been inviting Christians to think afresh about the ritual of baptism. So whenever <coughs> I'm talking about baptism, I say, so let's look at this. You have an African Asiatic brother mm -hmm. who goes to the Jordan River to join the Jewish Lives Matter movement to say something about the power of the empire and how the empire has actually got its boot on the neck of oppressed people. So what if we thought about it's not washing away of sins. It's a political commitment to put my body in the space to help other people become free. So how do we use our religious rituals and occasions to politicize people, to take radical action for the overthrow of all that is evil. I have a, I have a question, because I, I agree with that. And how do, we, how do we acknowledge that that's not how the text was written? The text was from, if, if we're gonna use, if we're gonna use baptism, bapti, baptism in a new way or, or creative way, like reimagining it, like you're doing, which is great. How do we also not negate that the washing away of sins was which the initial ritual was focused on? Without, like for me, it's what I see happening is that we are afraid to acknowledge that, to skip that part and we, we go to the new. And what happens is I, I feel like a lot of people who, who want to hear this firm acknowledgement that no, this is talking about washing away sins. And sins have been, the, the, the idea of that I, I need to have my sins cleansed to become whole, like people need to be affirmed that they aren't crazy, that they aren't, that they aren't, they aren't going crazy about the fact that no, you told me that I was a sinner and the text tells me that too. And, and you know, so I, I'm all for the reimagining and doing creative ways. And I think that it's important that there's some level of critique about um, where, the, where the practices have come from and, and the damage that that has done before we move forward with, without proper healing and guidance in that process. Mm. Here's the way I would say this. Mm -hmm. I think there's an opportunity in our religious traditions mm -hmm. to actually ask the question that you're inviting us to ask. The move that I attempted to make that you are labeling as new, mm -hmm. part of me would wanna say, actually, that might be the more original. Mm -hmm. And that what mm -hmm. came later was a domestication of that which was so radical. Cause mm -hmm. the prophet from Galilee was executed mm -hmm. in his early 30s by the state. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. so it was a very radical thing that happened because sure. of what the movement that he joined, right? He didn't create a movement. He was joining something. Mm -hmm. He might have put a spin on it, but he was joining something that was already quite radical. His teacher got executed mm -hmm. by the state. Mm -hmm. yeah. So these are very threatening figures. So what often happens, there's this domestication move. Mm -hmm. What happens if we actually take folks back to some of those more radical roots that exist in many of our traditions that often over time get domesticated because they convey inconvenient truth? I agree with that. And this text do say that this is taking away <coughs> the sins of the world. And, and I, so for me, I agree with what you just said too. So I'm not in disagreement. I'm, I'm just naming that I feel like that, that we haven't acknowledged the initial wound that many people experience and feel when reading the text and also being in religious institutions that use words like sin, being cleansed of sin, um, no, ma no, matter how, no matter how powerful the rituals can be if we reimagine them to fit a, a cultural context that's appropriate for today. Yeah. In the Muslim community, it's interesting because um, in, in the black Christian community, I feel y'all are so far ahead um, when it comes to talking about politics and voting. Um, we are so far behind because it's, if, to me, it seems like it's one or the other. So a lot of people just don't vote. Um, and then the people who do vote, they don't vote based on like social issues. They vote, they vote based on their pocketbook. So um, prior to Trump, and even some people did vote for Trump who were Muslim, but prior to Trump, a lot of Muslims were voting straight Republican because a lot of Muslims had money. So they were thinking about their pockets, not really how policies were gonna affect the communities around them. So we have so much work to do in our community. Um, I think that our religious leaders need to stop ignoring the conversation and make it an active part of our weekly discussions and how that affects us. Because even from a religious standpoint, we should be engaging in, in voting. So we're so behind. And there's a concept in Buddhism called Zuihobini, which says to practice according to the customs of the land, mm -hmm. unless it violates the tenets of Same your here. religion. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so what you're saying here just really woke me up <laughs> that you would use baptism, especially as I remember that your sins were taken by the grace of Jesus' death. That's what I was taught a long, long time ago. So I don't know if that's still what's happening in the Christian church, but um, so it's like, it's already done. That act, <coughs> his death washed away the sins of the world, as I understand it. So what continues to get lost in the political discussion is number one, voting is not enough. Right. There has to be follow up and there has to be action that is part of an organized movement in between the elections and there has to be an economic consequence of these political actors who we put into position who either betray or engage in what agenda we send them there with so on all of those three fronts there is lacking in that right and in the faith tradition whether you tell people to vote, but you're not talking about how your local money is being used in your locality right there and how you're gonna use that for political power. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't see that going on anywhere, even on the national stage. And I see it going on with the white terrorist movement who understands how they can manipulate their system of misfaith or whatever you wanna call it, how people will ignore aspects that go against their own faith because Politically, it'll be better for their kids and economically. Mm -hmm. So activating our own communities of faith from sociopolitical and economic perspectives under those three regards, is something we have to get busy on like yeah. yesterday. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So we, we really only have time for one more question. Okay. And I'm going to pose this question kind of in two parts um, and ask you to give kind of a one sentence response to it. Um, you don't have to go in order. You can pop up and pop around. But if we could offer wisdom, and it's going to go back and forth. So millennials, if we could offer wisdom to the village elders who lead various religious 
and spiritual communities in our country and around the globe, what would that wisdom be? What do you need to learn from the village elders or religious or spiritual traditions? And vice versa, village elders, if you could offer wisdom to millennials who are leading and preparing to lead various religious and spiritual communities in our country and around the globe, what would that wisdom be? And what do you yourselves need to learn from millennial leaders today? So one sentence, we can go around, you can think about it, whoever wants to pop up first, um, kind of as our <coughs> parting gift to one another. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. This kind of perspective of, okay, we, we, we've worked on this church, we feel like this church has served a role, we acknowledge that there are limitations, but don't just start over. Build on what's already there. I feel like that's a, con a, a theme that, 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 that a number of people have touched on in, in the last few conversations. I would say to the village elders, don't be afraid to accompany the millennials where they are. If they're in a coffee shop, accompany them. If they, you think their life is broken and falling apart, then accompany them in that. Uh, but don't have an idea of where they need to be before you're willing to embrace them. I would say treat me as an adult because I've never been too young to give, but I've often been too young to lead. Mm -hmm. And as an elder, I would say to millennials, do you mm -hmm. and only you, mm -hmm. not someone else's idea of you. Because once you do you, the richness and the fullness of all your energies and creativity will be exposed. I would say to the elders, um, maybe do less direction now and tell more stories. Because I think as a millennial, I love stories. I'm all for stories. And that really, I learn a lot from them. So tell more stories. And for my group, <laughs> maybe we could uh, be less judgmental and um, try, and cons try and consume more from the stories that our elders tell so that we can build. There's a huge resource in the people that you left behind. There's, a, there's people who have built and organized around taking care of the people that you may have thrown away. Mm -hmm. If you are going back, if you're trying to reimagine what you, what you look like in the future for us, I will go back and see what people are doing the work that you should have been doing. Mm -hmm. See what people who are feeding those queer babies, feeding, um, um, taking care of those mothers who may be thinking about abortion. Um, when we think about the people who the church is or the mosque is or whatever you are that's not, um, that they don't feel like they can come to you, there's people taking care of them. Mm -hmm. There's people yeah, who sure. are doing the work. How can you <laughs> go and ask them, hey, how are you doing this work? How can we be included? How can we support you in the work that you're doing? Because, you know, we want to heal the trauma that we caused. And so I would suggest going back and um, um, looking back and saying, hey, let me see who I can sow some seeds into to make, um, to heal that gap that's happening. As far as millennials, um, I, I feel the same way. I think we're doing some amazing, in my circle of people, in my community all around the country, I, I just see some beautiful things happening. We are doing the work. We are doing the things that um, heal people. And so just keep, keep doing what we're doing. I would say we need wings and roots. Mm -hmm. There are some problems, I would say, to millennials where we need your wings mm -hmm. to help us fly over this storm. And then I would also humbly remind them there are some problems that we need extraordinarily deep roots and that it is the rootedness that will keep the storm from overtaking us. So we need the ability to go beyond gravitational pull and we need real deep roots mm -hmm. as well. I would say two connected things. Um, first, value your own sense of well-being. Mm -hmm. Respect your own narratives. And secondly, I'm sorry mm -hmm. that you labor in a garden that we created. Genuine faith really requires a posture of humility. Mm -hmm. um, being able to say, I'm sorry. Being able to say, I don't have all of the answers. Mm -hmm. 
but also ultimately to say we need each other. Yes. Um, we need each other from our babies all the way to our most elder um, of elders. Um, but, but I think you begin with a sense of profound humility and, and humbleness. Um, I cannot know the mind of God, but I can believe that what I am most called to do is to love the person that I see every single day. Mm -hmm. And I begin there. As a millennial pastor to elders, I would say, don't be afraid to show your wound. <clears throat> um, so many of our elders have been fortified in terms of uh, leading with strengths, but never exposing weaknesses or even acknowledging them. And that has created great harm, but there's a lot that our generation can learn, mm -hmm. not simply from the successes, from the times that you may f have fallen down or didn't quite reach the mark, but continue to move forward. So not, not to be afraid to show or expose those wounds for the benefit of, of our village, for mutual learning, and so that we can grow and move beyond it. As a millennial, I just wanna say that um, we're all imperfect here. Don't drive yourself insane or crazy trying to be something you're not by believing that you have to be a certain way in order to live righteously. <clears throat> That's all subjective and it's all based on you and what you deem as what can be righteously good for you and your general well-being. And if you are feeling depressed, it's okay to seek help. It's okay to go to therapy. You don't, you can't pray everything away. As a millennial that I would say to my elders is, um, Thank you. Um, you know, I, I see your humanity and um, um, I, I value you and I, um, I, I even cherish you. And um, please help me to reimagine um, my personal narratives and um, help me to reimagine um, how I see the world. I've enjoyed breaking bread with you. I've enjoyed uh, being in conversation with you. I know there's so much more we could be talking about and so many more activities and thoughts percolating in your minds. Um, but this is the beginning of the conversation. Uh, this is the beginning of the work of how we go back into our communities um, and continue these conversations amongst generations um, as we march toward this end goal to freedom. Right. And I think that's what we've all been talking about, marching towards uh, this moment of freedom. So thank you for breaking bread with us today. Thank you for being in community. <laughs> Thanks for the laughs. Thanks for uh, the joyous moments uh, for all of you. Uh, we ask that you continue to follow us in this conversation. Uh, our next stop for the God Talk tour is Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, again, please follow us on Instagram, follow us on uh, Twitter and Facebook uh, at Namak, N M. A -A -H -C, uh, and follow the hashtag God Talk, hashtag Black Faith uh, to chime into the dialogue and also see previous God Talk conversations. Until next time, good night.